Good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the Air Force Association, welcome once again. The topic of this address is leading air power in the 21st century. Our speaker is the Assistant Vice Chief of Staff and Director Air Staff, Headquarters U.S. Air Force, Washington, D.C. He also serves as the Deputy Chairman of the Air Force Council and is the Air Force Accreditation Official for the International Corps of Air Attaches. Prior to his current assignment, he served as Commander U.S. Air Force's Central Command, Southwest Asia. In that capacity, he was responsible for developing contingency plans and conducting air operations in a 20-nation area of responsibility covering Central and Southwest Asia. Each of you should have a copy of his bio. After a short presentation, he will take questions. Notice on your chair you should have a question card. Please fill those out and get them to the aisles, and we'll get those in front of uh, our speaker. We're very pleased to have him with us. Please welcome to the stage General John Hesterman. Thanks, Brother. Grinnon, you told me there are going to be 20 people here. <laughs> um, so I'm guessing looking at the crowd that a lot of you thought you were coming to hear the Vice Chief of Staff. So let me, um, let me apologize. One thing about having vice in your job titles, it means you don't get to control your own schedule. So, uh, so you guys get me. And the good news for you is I didn't have time to develop the 45-minute diatribe and PowerPoint slides that I would have given a little bit more time. But um, what I'd like to do is, is talk to you a little bit today, mostly about the job that I came from, since I actually know more about that than the one that I'm doing, at least at this point. And, um, and, um, and then I'll be happy to take your questions. But um, First, let me tell you, it's really a, as satisfying as that job that I came from was, it's really nice to be home. I still can't quite get over how green it is. Uh, you know you've been living in the Middle East for a couple of years when you're surprised by rain. Uh, weekends are a novelty, and two days in them is really cool. We had three the other day. That was awesome. Um, and it kills me to say this, but after Riyadh and Amman and driving in Doha, traffic around here is pretty friendly. Uh, the reason I'm here is because in my capacity as the director of the air staff, I was sitting in a staff meeting waxing, I'm sure not particularly eloquently, about how complex and difficult the, the role of airmen in the current fight in Iraq and Syria is right now, and, and yet what an incredible job that they're doing. And somebody told me that I should give that little talk to a broader audience, so I can't think of a better audience than the aerospace nation we have gathered here. And um, it's truly great. I see a lot of friends in the audience. Please remember I said that when it times, comes time for questions. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about what your airmen have been doing. And I'll start with this. Your airmen are magnificent. They're superb. They're better than we've ever been. And I know most of you know that already. But, and that's true all over the world. I'm going to focus a little bit on the AOR that I just came from, just because I'm a little bit more familiar with what they've been doing. And I'll tell you what I walked away from that from. And, um, and then you can ask me about that. Um, but I want to be clear about a couple of things. First of all, in Iraq and Syria, your airmen have been responsible for virtually every victory on the battlefield. They've been taking the enemy off the battlefield at a rate greater than 1,000 a month for over a year. They've delivered supplies and food and water to people that needed it in places like Mount Sinjar and Amerli in Iraq and Kobani in Syria. And then they taught the Iraqis how to do it so that they can do it for themselves. They did that in a couple of weeks. They're responsible for our allies retaking significant portions of territory in both Iraq and Syria. And this next one's important. They're also the reason the Iraqi government has a little bit of time to get their governance in order. They're the reason that the Iraqi military, with our help, has the time to reorganize and to fight back and take their country back. They're also the reason the international coalition of some 60 nations has the time to get after the other international lines of effort, stemming foreign fighter flows, making sure that we combat their I.O. campaigns, crushing their terrorist financing, stabilizing the territories that have been liberated now and the humanitarian work that goes along with that, all of which are going to be necessary to defeat this enemy. I'm going to call them DAS because that's what I'm used to. I mean ISIS, I mean ISIL, all the same despicable terrorists. But let me back up just for a little bit here and, and talk about air power in this conflict. 
So back in August, your Air Power Coalition stood up in a little less than a week, August of last year. The week after that, we were matching and exceeding the levels of effort in Afghanistan. Only air power can do that with that kind of speed and on that kind of scale. And we are part of a big joint team, and it takes all of it to get anything done. But I'll tell you this, with that air power at the low end, high end of warfare, the joint team fails, period. The other thing about this conflict is it's a little bit different than some we fought, at least in the 30 year, two years or so that I've been hanging around. So, you know, and I know most of you guys know this, but going after a nation state, taking down an IADS, going after a, a fielded army, our youngsters can do that in their sleep. It's not that hard. This enemy wrapped itself around the population before we ever got a chance to start. So we had to set up a 24-7 watch over the battlefield so that we could kill them wherever we could find them. The good news about that is your folks are really good at it. They hit the target over 97% of the time. And they do it with an unprecedented level lack of collateral damage or unintended casualties. And, um, and I, will, I will tell you, first of all, it, it's, it's literally the most precise, least amount of unintended damage conflict in the history of aerial warfare, without a doubt. And there's a couple reasons that's important. The first one is, is because it's the right thing to do. It's what separates us from the guys that we're fighting, who will happily kill anybody that isn't them. The other reason is we can. We can have a significant impact on the enemy, you know, kill them at a great rate, and not kill people we don't mean to. It's also necessary. You know, some of those other lines of effort that are necessary to get after this hybrid enemy require more than just us, which means you have to keep a coalition together. And when you have a coalition of Sunni Arabs and a coalition of Western democracies whose populations won't tolerate civilian casualties on any kind of scale, and the reason I know that is because I spent the better part of the last year hanging around at Chad conferences and Chiefs of Defense conferences and ministerials, and every single time, the leaders of those governments came by and thanked us for the way we were prosecuting this campaign because it was the only reason they could stay. The good news is, is your guys are good enough to get after the enemy and play by those rules. So, and it's a growth business. The last two months in Iraq and Syria have been the most kinetic on record. I like to think it's because they were well taught, but it's probably just because they're really good. And just let me give you an example, last Tuesday, we emptied three B-1s over Iraq and Syria. 80 targets in 20 minutes on IED storage areas in Ramadi. That's significant. Your guys are good at this. The intelligence community is coming together. We're turning a lot of that you know, exquisite intelligence they have into finite target sets. The tough part about before is we didn't start with those target sets. You know, that target set never existed for the type of enemy that we started fighting against right away. It doesn't mean we can't get after it. It doesn't mean it isn't a growth industry. It truly is. And the guys are making that happen as we speak. So, but I just wanted to give you a, a little bit of, of perspective about why that's true. And let me tell you something else about air power. And again, and don't misunderstand me. Unleashing air power and the way that our air power advocates talk about it is exactly the right thing for us to be discussing and for us to get after. But I just wanted to let you know, the biggest advocates of air power right now are guys you know, like Tony Thomas, the Joint Task Force Commander because without us, he can't get after the HVI set that he's after. You know, it's James Terry, it's Lloyd Austin. Let me tell you a little story about General Austin just for a second, and this will, just because this audience will appreciate it. But, and this actually predates what we're, we've been doing over there for the last year or so, but just by a little bit. But he was sitting at the head of the table at, at LUD at the Combined Air Operations Center, and on one screen was a data link of about 70 different airplanes flying around from the Nellis Range, you know, simulating a contingency operation that we were doing there. There was a JFAC on the screen from Shaw that was doing the US only portion of this particular exercise. There was a target picture real time like from a classified source that was you know, 8,000 miles away. Um, and right outside the door, we were doing a very robust and significantly large air and missile defense exercise, you know, protecting the Arabian Gulf. You know, a standard Air Force exercise day. 
So this six foot seven inch infantryman gets up from the table. He says, kid, that's me, come with me. Okay, he's a big guy, did what he said. And he got into the office. He's a fairly stoic guy, anybody that knows him. Here's what he did. He went, oh dear God, I had no idea. I had no idea the Air Force could do what it does. And John, the American people don't know how good the Air Force is. And then he called General Welsh and apologized to him for taking the Air Force for granted for the first 39 years of his career. True story. So the only reason I tell you that is because that's how good your airmen are. You know, and again, convincing you know, one army general that the Air Force is good is not the right answer, but by God, the fact that we did it was pretty cool. But this audience can convince a lot of people of that, and that'll be important. So the rub of this is the policy path that our nation has chosen is to assist the Iraqi government in, in training and developing their force so they can fight and take their country back. That may be the only long-term way to do it, I don't know. But what that means for us is that we're going to be at this for a while. Because there's no plan out there that doesn't ask for air power in significant numbers for the entire plan. That plan takes three or four years. So the thing that's interesting for us as an Air Force is we're going to have to lead our way through that. We'll have to provide that air power for, for this as it goes forward. But that's the low end of warfare. The stuff we're doing now is not fighting China. It's not fighting adversaries that have significantly more capability. But we have to be able to do that, which means that our nation is going to have to pay for both the high end and the low end. And we're going to have to train our incredible airmen to do both. And our nation is going to demand that we do both. I know you all know that. The only good news in that part of this discussion is our airmen, even though there's less of them than there's ever been before, they're better than we ever were. So all us old guys in the room, it's not even close. They're really good. They get the mission done every time. They get it done in ways that I never thought of. Kayak was great. If I asked a question, three guys showed up, they told me the answer, and then they told me the question I should have asked, and then they answered that every time. So we're going to have to, in order, to, the only thing about these great airmen is we have to keep them. And in order to do that, we have to do one of two things. If we're going to meet this demand signal, we either have to temper it or get more of them. And while we're doing that, we have to take care of them and their families. We have to give them the realist, realistic training that we all got that made this Air Force great. You know, I never went into any kind of conflict that I wasn't ready for. We can't do that to them either. Again, I know in a big way I'm preaching to the choir here. The reason I'm saying it is because we're going to need all your help. We have to be able to do both. We have to give them the training, we have to give them the equipment, and we have to, to develop them and take care of them in a way that they stay with us. Sounds obvious. It's really hard. Anyway, I wish they could all see the chief's speech yesterday. They'd be signing up in droves. But, um, but you guys know that already. All right, I'm going to stop talking. I, um, the, like I said, the good news for you is that's all I had planned because I thought I was sharing the stage. But it didn't quite work out that way. So let me um, remember that you, you like me and, you're, and answer, ask whatever questions that you want. Sir. Thanks, kid. Well, we have some good questions for you. <laughs> All of them easy. So I'll start off with a really easy one. I think I could even tell you where this might have come from. How can we get the leadership in Washington, D.C. to allow us to launch a full air campaign so we can finally sever the head of the snake? I don't know. Um, but I think what we can do is, you know, the thing that's tricky about this is turning our exquisite intelligence capability into targetable data. You know, I mean, that's what you need to, to get after an enemy like this. We're getting better at that. But, you know, in my humble opinion, that our ability to do that had atrophied a little bit before we started, you know, this campaign. So it doesn't mean we don't, or we're not watching them closely. It doesn't mean we can't get after them, you know, in, in significant ways. We can do that really quickly, by the way, and if you guys want to talk about that, I'm happy to. But what I think we need to do is I think we need to robust our ability to turn all the actionable intelligence we have into data that where we can get after the, this enemy in a, in a robust way, and then we can utilize all the air power that we can bring to bear. Yeah. 
Here's another softball. What about the Air Force and its mission execution, not only in that area, but globally, it keeps you up at night? I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What, does the, what about the Air Force and its mission execution globally keeps you up at night? Um, virtually nothing about its mission execution. I mean, that's the thing we're good at. Uh, having enough of it, I mean, you know, I, I hear, I watch our leadership having to make really tough choices. You know, in my humble opinion, we ought to pay for all of it. I mean, when we talk about, you know, there's nothing that we do, you know, no conflict that we're in that isn't dependent on air power, you know, and, and, and all realms of it. I mean, no other joint service or no other service in the joint environment can do the things they need to do without what we do. We have to keep making that story known. We have to make sure that people pay for those things that we need. And we have to tell them what we're not going to be able to do if they don't pay for that. You know, our, our leadership does that pretty rigorously. We're all going to have to do it if we're going to get their attention, I think. Has the strike approval chain helped or hurt our ability to bring the fight to the enemy? My position on, on that is we are able to get after the enemy you know, very, very quickly. And in the times that we don't, you know, I guess what I would want people to understand is the environment on the ground there is not clear. You know, the, it doesn't take any time at all to get permission to put a bomb in the ground. And if it's self-defense, if they're shooting at people that, you know, that we know and love and we're watching that closely, we can attack right now. I mean, nothing stops self-defense ever. The tricky part about this is the number of times that the initial call on the enemy on the ground was incorrect, more than 100 by the time that I left the theater. And that's not because these guys aren't really good. It's because it's really difficult to tell a bunch of folks that are dressed the same and, and pretending to be each other, or at least they're pretending to be the Iraqi army. And frankly, the Iraqi army had some work to do, just an organization to figure out where they were. So in order to make sure we weren't killing the wrong guys, every now and again, you had to let the Iraqi army do their thing and figure out where their folks were. That can be a little frustrating. You know, that's not changing the strategic course of this battle by any stretch of the imagination. But I will tell you, you know, as I stated, we're taking the enemy off the battlefield at a great rate. And you don't do that by not killing them where you find them. Sometimes you have to wait for them to move away from the mosque or the school or the innocent people's homes that they're hiding in, and some guy might fly home frustrated because he didn't get to kill him. But the guy that shows up right after him probably does get to kill him because that's the only way you get to those kinds of numbers, and he's not dissatisfied at all. So I'm, I'm, I think the hard part about this one is identifying who the enemy is. You know, they're hiding in a big way. It's not stopping CQ Brown and the, the, the coalition air team there from killing them, you know, by the way. Those numbers are going up, not down. But that's the reason that every now and again it takes a little bit longer. That's the reason that you know, we're very, very careful about it. Can you imagine if even some percentage of those times we killed a bunch of Iraqi soldiers? That coalition would have unwound in a week. And we need it to do what we're doing. I believe this question is a boots on the ground question. Is the current policy to use only air operations against ISIL? handicapping the coalition's effort and prolonging their defeat? Yeah, I think there's a lot of opinions on this. And, um, the trick about boots on the ground is for one boot on the ground that you're getting fighting, there's about 10 pairs of boots on the ground to support that guy. So if you want to make that kind of commitment, you know, the, that is a way to do it. I think that the strategy that they have is they're going to let the, the Iraqis fight for their country and take it back for, the, for, for themselves. And, and again, you know, we've been at this a couple of different ways. That might be the right way to do it. It just takes a while. And they're not going to go nearly as fast as we want them to. For us, that means we're going to be at this for a while. And we have to figure out a way to do that. But, you know, if you're asking me if putting a bunch of U.S. soldiers back on the ground in Iraq is the right answer, I don't think our nation will tolerate it. Um, from your recent experience, uh, how do you feel uh, about your preparedness and how the Air Force prepares leaders uh, to function at the operational level of war, i.e. being a JFAC? 
Well, I mean, I, we can always get better at it, so let me just start with that. But we've been doing this for a long time now. And, you know, the, the one thing about being in, the, in this environment is, you know, everybody there has been there before for the most part. So the communication, you know, across the joint force is outstanding. You know, I mean, there's no, a lot of the, the tensions that used to be there before, a lot of the I don't trust you organizations that were built, even in places, you know, as recent as ISAF, don't exist as much anymore. So airmen and, and, and are, are sitting right there at the table and they're taking that advice and, and given the, the limited resources we have, they're executing it, you know, pretty damn well. But, um, but you know, the, the broader question here, though, is we, we may need to start organizing ourselves a little differently. I mean, you know, there is no reason at all why an airman, you know, can't be the CENTCOM commander or can't be the JTF commander or can't be, you know, parked at the head of the table for all these things. We all know how to do this now. Having this, this conversation, you know, about who's in charge. You know, by the way, when we were going to roll into Syria the first time, you know, AFSENT was the supported commander. The guy calling all the component commanders together to talk to them about how we're going to do this was me. We just didn't go. So, you know, people ask me sometimes in the job that I came from, you know, why I wasn't the JTF commander. I'll tell you the answer to that, because that guy spent six or seven of his hours of his day trying to galvanize the Iraqi government and army into doing things that are going to be necessary to realize the policy position that we've taken. You know, the absent commander is busy fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria and pointing at Yemen and ready to fight, you know, across the Gulf. I'm not saying an airman can't do that. They can do it easily. Just not that airman. He's got more to do. If we defeat ISIL, or when we defeat them, how do we prevent the next terrorist group, paramilitary, what have you, from taking their place? Well, I'd have written my book if I knew the answer to that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I do think that as we communicate, you know, I th nations are figuring out that we have to talk to each other. You know, you can't stem foreign fighter flows. You can't stop financing. You can't even get after information operations unless you have a multinational whole of government effort, which is one of the reasons keeping the coalition together is so important. Um, but, you know, we're going to have to be diligent and we're going to have to, you know, pay really close attention. And, and I wish I had a better answer than that. Yeah. What is your assessment of uh, Russia deploying forces to Syria? And what are the risks and will the Air Force uh, adjust to operations or have to do operations if the Russians start flying combat missions? Yeah, I, you know, from a, I, I think anybody that's ever paid any attention to Syria has walked away with the conclusion that this is gonna have to be a negotiated political settlement. I mean, I don't think anybody's gonna fight their way to victory in Syria personally. And, um, that said, does it make it more complicated? Of course it does. I mean, is it clever on their part? Probably. It, you know, it certainly makes sure they have a seat at the table when the negotiation starts. But um, I'm not real concerned about, um, you're always concerned, you know, if I were the operational commander, I would be concerned clearly about a misinterpretation, about, you know, some sort of unintended consequence. But those guys aren't interested in being in the air against the United States. Not there. You know, that's not what that's about. They're going to defend that regime, and they're going to do it by making sure we don't get too close to them. But, you know, it, it makes the, comp the situation far more complicated. At the end of the day, you know, a bunch of diplomats are going to have to sit down and work that out. And, you know, who knows? Maybe it'll be easier to talk to Russia than it is the Assad regime. I don't know. But, um, but uh, I don't think that it doesn't make it easier. Um, I don't know if it makes it worse or better. You discussed about the solution set has to be, you know, with the forces there and the, and the governments there. Um, we trained the Iraqi forces for years in OIF, and they collapsed pretty quickly when challenged. What do you think is different uh, this time? Well, I, I don't think they're afraid to fight. You know, I do think that, that they can be made into a capable force. I think that there are a, are a number of sectarian, tribal, government, pick a adjective, you know, kinds of issues they have to work through there. I think what they need to get after is their operational level of government. I think they have to be able to, you know, galvanize their troops and have somebody that they trust taking them forward into battle. And you'll note that every time there's a competent ground force with the help of coalition air power, they win every single time. So I think that's what they have to get after. I think they have to, we have to concentrate on their operational level of leadership. You're a little bit out of my expertise here. I'm not a trainer of the Iraqi army, but, um, 
but that's what I walked away from that conflict believing. Could you talk a little bit about uh, some of the support or non-kinetic uh, aircraft and, and forces that are helping th that fight, uh, specifically uh, electronic combat, compass call, for example? Um, you know, what can I say about them? They're magnificent. They do really good work, and I can't really talk in a ballroom stage in a hotel much more than that. But, um, but you know, the, the entire air power enterprise, I mean, you know, what is it, 600 million pounds of fuel that's been passed. I mean, the fact that, you know, my fighter pilot friends are going to get anxious here, but what makes us a superpower is we can pick anybody ourselves up and put them wherever we want to, anywhere on the planet. We have the greatest mobility force in the world. You know, our ISR force, when we get to use it in the way that air forces know how to use it, is wildly effective. That's a little bit of a rub that we still need to treat, you know, teach our other service members. Is you know, When we stack that stuff up in the ways that we know how to, we get to answers very, very quickly, as opposed to the 24-7 requirement for situational awareness, which really means FMV, that we battle all the time. I mean, we've got to get past that. But... Um, but you know, I, I could stand up here all day and cheerlead for, for our air power capability. I mean, they're, they're incredibly good. And the thing that always stunned me is whatever we asked them to do, they did it sooner than I thought. I mean, walking up to an airlift guy and saying, can we drop a bunch of food and water on this place tonight? And they're going, well, how about early this afternoon? Okay. Kid you not, that's how it works. They're really good. And they hit every target they go after. And the whole coalition does that. You know, if you're an industry guy, by the way, interoperability and munitions and systems, I'd write that down. Speaking of the coalition, uh, how much engagement uh, building partner capacity and relationships did you do in, in that previous job, and was it enough? Um, well, yeah, I mean, the, the hardest part about that is it, you know, our system, because of the way it's designed, takes a really long time to deliver any of those things. So it's, you know, it's frustrating for, for some of our partners. Um, but when you go to war together, it knocks down a lot of those barriers. So I talked about the first time we were going into Syria. The first conversation I had with the Saudi air chief was on a Thariya phone in a parking lot, which seems kind of goofy when you're standing next to a Kayak, one of the most exquisite command and control facilities on the planet. By the time we got into what we're doing now, all those guys could pick up a secure phone and talk to me on it you know, in real time. You know, the action officer for that was the CENTCOM commander. You know, sometimes it takes that to make those things go faster. But the first thing you always get asked in coalition warfare, and that's what we do now, is who's going with you? You know, and you talk to those four guys and I'll talk to these three guys and every level of our government is doing this at the same time. And the only reason you can do that is because guys like North and Hostage and Goldfein had relationships with those folks. So when you call them up, they actually take the call and then when you say, you need to come with us or you're, you know, making a, a strategic mistake for your nation, they actually believe you and they come. And then to keep the coalition together, you have to give them something worthwhile. Their nations are taking a fairly significant risk of people and capital and equipment. And you have to make it worthwhile for them. You have to give them, you know, you have to show that they're making an impact against the enemy so they can go back and continue to justify why they're there. And some of these guys are coming from a long way as you know. So, I am, um, you know, the, uh, every time we go to fight together, we wish we'd been better at what you just asked me about because now we're looking for interoperability. We're trying to talk to each other. We're trying to, you know, understand the weapons that our coalition partners are using so we can, you know, have them make the impacts that we need them to have. So, you know, in my humble opinion, you can't go fast enough in improving the speed and accuracy of those kinds of things. Or, getting the intelligence you need to, if you're going to go fight with somebody, you ought to be able to tell them what they're doing. So the first time you say, hey, come with us, here's the one target you can look at, you know, they're just not particularly interested in that. So that's something that we have to get better at because I'm pretty well convinced this is the way that warfare for at least the generation we're growing up, that's how we're going to do this. So in that line, um how do we better prepare our airmen for those kind of coalition operations and for our folks to, uh, quote, drink tea and engage globally to build these coalitions? You know, I, I don't think that's as big a problem as we think because, you know, unlike some of us where the first time you got to do that is when you were a fairly senior guy, you know, the folks that were growing, they do this all the time. I mean, you know, they're used to being with coalition partners and, now, I can't tell you, when you're, when you're putting an air campaign together and the Emirati walks in and the American walks in and they know each other, 
you know, it, it, it's pretty impressive. Oh, by the way, just for fun, one of my favorite nights is, you know, it's 2 o'clock in the morning on the first night that the GCC coalition's going into Syria, and the, um, and the Emirati one star is sitting next to me at the head of the table. His, his four ship had just gone through and laid waste to every target that they were after, and I went, man, they're pretty good. And he said, yeah, she's awesome. <laughs> and I, of course, went, what'd you say? <laughs> and um, so, you know, for the father of a 17-year-old daughter, that was just cool. But, um, but... I'm just telling you that those kinds of things happen because we've socialized a lot of, of what we do at a very young age. So I'm not real concerned about that. I think these guys are going to be able to sit down at the table and, and do just fine with our coalition partners. One of the things we saw uh, and continuing through the air campaign is, is the F-22 em employed there. Uh, obviously, probably not quite as anti-axis kind of a role for that kind of airplane, but the ability to do all the other stuff it does things that the F-35 will be able to do. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it, I mean, it's an incredible capability. And, and you know, and, and we did send it places we weren't going to send other, you know, just to keep the risk down. Oh, by the way, when I left, I think their hit rate was 100%, which for an air-to-ground guy makes me really happy. You know, just because, you know, they could... But any time we did anything important, you know, whether that's the task force, you know, sneaking a hostage out, whatever we were doing, you, know, you can bet the F-22 was in the middle of it every single time. And, um, and they're really good. And, and they were often the mission commander because they have situational awareness that nobody else has, you know, which they're really good at sharing. So, you know, I, again, I can't say enough good things. People that, that don't, it would be better if people understood how comprehensively helpful those kinds of aircraft are, and no matter, even when you're doing low-end kind of stuff. I mean, they're, they're incredible. Do you foresee the capability to effectively run an air operations center by GCC nations in the near future, and how vital is that to our national interests in the future? Well, I think the thing that's important about that is they're going to do it whether we like it or not. So the, the more we can be interoperable with what they're doing, the more we can help them with the way that they do it, the more that we can be involved in those processes. You know, the better understanding we'll have of what they're doing. So, and I will tell you, I mean, we, I parked my chaotic commander in the Saudi AOC just to make sure that we could give them as much help as possible, mostly to make sure they were killing the right folks and not doing anything that, that would be untenable for us. But, um, but again, you know, conflict makes those kinds of things go faster. But I think the, the best way to do that, I used to tell them all the time, I don't really care you know, where the headquarters is, as long as we can all talk to each other. And that's, you know, part of this, you know, systems interoperability thing that, I mean, it's the coin of the realm, truly. I mean, you know, the beauty of this is we can do this from Shaw. But, you know, so, you know, if they want to do their work from Riyadh, that's okay with me. We just need to make sure we can talk to them. Uh, this uh, question perhaps goes to more about what you're doing now in the Air Staff. Um, how should we balance rebuilding readiness with meeting COCOM demands for our shrinking and heavily tasked combat air forces? Well, you know, I think if you listen to our chief talk, he will tell you we, we've lived with this notion that we're a requirements-based force you know, for a long time, but we're not. We're a supply-based force because you can only do you know, with what you have. You know, I think the reality of that, we you know, need to get our hands around. And, and then we need to, you know, very clearly and very concisely tell them what we can and can't do with the decisions that they're making. But the good news is there's a lot of really smart people that are leaning into that pretty hard. And, um, you know, I, I, we'll get to the right answer. You know, I remember, and I, you know, I'm not trying to be trite about this, but my father used to come home when I was a little kid and tell me the Air Force was going to hell. You know, it didn't quite happen that way. We're pretty good. Doesn't mean that we don't have significant challenges that we need to go after. It just means that we're going to have to, you know, pay really close attention. But I'll just stop talking. So along those lines, as as we seek to uh, lessen the RPA cap requirement across the globe in order to get the training pipeline and, and all that working, how do you see that affect, you know, where you just came from and, and the GCC command uh, demands on that force? Well, you know, I think we have to temper our demand signal. And again, I think the demand signal, though, is largely driven by this 24-7 FMV requirement that some people, frankly, just don't need. So, you know, we're going to have to get wiser about how, how we do that. Um, I, I also think we're going to have to get 
you know, we all know where a lot of these assets are. You know, we can't let people hold on to them and, and only the Air Force be responsible for the ones that everybody gets to use. That's silly. You know, so we, we need to pay a little bit of attention to that as well. Uh, how active are the A-10s overseas and when will they start drawing down in deployments? I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. So how active are the A-10s overseas and when will they start drawing down in deployments? Um, not the force provider, I don't know. But um, okay. how active are they? They, we, like every other asset we have over there, we utilize them, you know, 24/7, uh, and they're great. And we all knew that, you know. And in this kind of warfare, they're particularly great, you know. But, but I will tell you, you guys know this, but CAS is relative. I mean, if if the A10's right there, that's the one I want. If I'm 200 miles away, that's not the one I want. It doesn't go fast enough. If I'm a special tactics operator, I want a B1 because it's gonna stay for 12 hours and drop 50 weapons. You know, it is what it is. You know, the, the argument that Chief is making very clearly here is we have to have an airplane that can fight in all the places they're gonna ask us to fight. You know, I don't think we should have to make a choice on that. I think we ought to pay for both. But that's an old guy coming from the field speech. So somebody has to make hard choices there. So there are some pundits that uh, take a look at the number of sorties flown, number of weapons dropped in prior air campaigns, especially in that region, and say, because of that comparison, uh, the air campaign that, that we're doing in Iraq and Syria is ineffective and inefficient. How would you answer that? Well, I mean, it's clearly not ineffective. It's the, every good thing that's happening there is a result of that air power capability. Um, you know, I. I Oh, by the way, we're dropping per sortie, we're dropping about five times the rate that we did in Afghanistan over the last 10 years. Nobody was getting too excited about that. You know, we, um, you know, as it turns out, they're getting better at this. They drop about half the time. But when you're there 24-7, this isn't taking off in waves of airplanes a couple times a day against target folders that you're holding in your hand. This is being there the entire time so that when the enemy shows itself or, you know, a friendly force forces them into the ocean, we open, we can kill them. You know, you have to be there the entire time. It's not unreasonable at all to be flying at the rates or dropping at the rates that we are. Can we drop more? As, you know, it's a growth industry, as I said. We're getting after more and more targets. So could you comment on how our airmen are holding up uh, mentally uh, with all the deployments and, and the fight that's going on now? Um, yeah, they're doing great, but, you know, but it wears on you. And you know, some of these folks have been back over and over and over again. And we, we do have to figure out how to temper the demand signal or make more of them um, or, or we're going to have a problem. That's always been true. But you know, for the most part, they are exceptionally proud of the incredibly good work that they're doing, and, and they're really, really good at it. But it would be wrong to say that, that they aren't tired. Uh, this next card is, is more of a statement. Uh, the kid, thanks from your fans in the second row. <laughs> There's nobody in the second row. <laughs> well, General Hussman, uh thanks so much uh, for your presentation and for bearing with me and, and the questions. Uh, on behalf of the Air Force Association, please accept this gift as a token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.